You're listening to the Mushroom Revival Podcast. Over one and a quarter million fungal specimens share a space known as the Fungarium at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. It is the largest collection of dried fungi in the world, containing specimens dating as far back as the 1700s. It's comparable to a global seed bank, but for fungal tissue. And today, we welcome two of the mycologists on the team who run the show and help make this epic collection possible. I'm Tuula Niskanen. I'm a researcher and I work in Royal Botanic Gardens Q in London. And I study fungal diversity and uh, basically I'm interested in knowing uh, which fungi occur in, uh, in the world and where they occur in the world and I also describe new species to science and why I am interested in fungi is that without fungi we would not really exist. My name is Lee Davis and I am one of the curators here at Q's uh, Fungarium. My job is it's a bit like a librarian, I guess. So I, I make sure that the collections are available for researchers to use. Everything from looking at biochemistry up to the genetics of fungi. The Fungarium as a whole is, is a huge and important resource for fungal science because of the, the taxonomic range and the historical breadth of the collections that we have. It's basically a collective memory of uh, biodiversity that has been collected in there. So today on the show, we are getting archival. When, where, why, and how are fungi from all over the world collected, studied, and preserved? And there are, of course, other fungaria in the world, but it's a very historical collection and uh, has many uh, very valuable uh, parts in it. And for example, uh, it includes 50,000 type specimens of fungi. So type specimens, these are specimens that essentially define a species. They are the original materials used to link a fungus and the name it was given by taxonomists. Q has a particularly impressive collection of these type specimens. And with current DNA technologies, nearly all of the dried fungi can be sequenced to further genetics research. And for those who don't know, what's the importance of a fungarium? Is, is there a reason why you need the dry specimens and not just pictures? I mean, what are the, the different uses of, of a fungarium? A good question. So yes, we want to have the specimens because if you would have a photograph, um, and later on, it would be revealed that there are several species that look alike. You wouldn't be able to tell from the photo uh, which species that is. So you need something physical. And also the f uh, physical specimens, uh, they also store the genomes of fungi. So uh, with the current methods, we are able to read uh, quite a lot of the uh, genetic code of species, uh, even from the very old fungarium specimens. Are there any instances where you have a specimen that you can't derive any genetic information, and what do you do in that instance? Yes, there are cases when we are not able to extract any DNA or it has been uh, chopped in so uh, small species that it's not useful anymore. So then we can't have the genetic information, but still we have the morphological information. So at least we have the dried mushroom or a, if it's a small cup fungus, for example, we have that one. So it's still enough for morphological studies to use that, for example, to how they differ from other species that have been found. And there are also other uses. So it's, it's also a historical memory. So if certain species are collected at a certain time of the history, let's say during the Chernobyl uh, accident or species collected before that or after that, and the, uh, there was a lot of radiation, uh, some of that radiation was also, it went to the fungi, the mushrooms. So you can see kind of the effect of the Chernobyl from these uh, dried fungi that have been collected uh, before the accident and after the accident. So these are, this is, for example, another type of use for 
fungi or there might be cases when you need a certain substance from fungi whether it will be something related that they they are toxic or they have some other characteristics so you can have uh, uh, mushroom specimens and you can try to extract uh, these substances from the dried fungi. So I'm curious when you allow researchers to come into the fungarium who are these people? Are they pharmacologists looking for new species of fungi to investigate their chemical compounds or curious mycologists, ecologists? Who who tends to come through your doors and why? Mostly uh, they are other taxonomists, so people who are interested in uh, studying uh, which fungi occur in the world and how they are related to one another. So that's the main uh, bulk of, of visitors. But, of course, there are some who are, as you mentioned, interested in their ecology or their chemistry. So all, all kinds of visitors and also artists uh, want to come there just to see like what kind of fungi there are and uh, historians to see kind of the history. And, of course, fungarium is also uh, linked to, to the arts library and archives that we have in queue which stores uh, a lot of the literature, the uh, paintings, and that type of information. So it's used by many different types of people, and, and of course students as well. Anyone who is interested can visit the fungarium, and upon request, they will prepare a sample of a given specimen to support researchers. So under what circumstances are they pulled from the archives? Who's asking for them, and why? Usually we're really very open to the idea of people using the collections, especially when it comes to what gets termed destructive sampling. So taking pieces of a specimen, um, grinding it up and, you know, getting the DNA out of it or, or looking at the biochemistry of it. Um, so normally if, 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 a, if a researcher contacts us and said, oh, I'd, I'd like to borrow this specimen for DNA work, especially if it hasn't been um, looked at before for those purposes, we will almost always say yes, because the real value in the collection is the data that we get associated with that specimen. Um, and sometimes getting that data means destroying a part of a specimen. Um, luckily, if someone's doing um, genomics work, they might take out a piece of the gills, you know, a, a few millimeters in square, for instance. So it's not always the whole thing that gets destroyed, it's a small piece. Um, and as long as we get that data back, that's adding value to the specimen, if you like. The majority of specimens are preserved by simply drying them. No special tricks. Although ideally the specimens are collected and dried as soon as possible. You can do this with a standard food dehydrator set no higher than 40 degrees Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit to preserve the DNA. Once they've been completely dried, they go into envelopes with their respective information and are filed away next to their sister taxa. Uh, we do have a relatively small collection that's preserved in spirit, which I think is, is, I think there's a little bit of formaldehyde and ethanol in it. For fungi that are quite interesting three dimensionally, like some of the stinkhorns, for instance. But I think that's, you know, a few thousand specimens are stored like that. The, everything else, you know, 1.1 1. 1 and a quarter million, they're dried. That's all we do. It seems that drying is all that's completely necessary. Um, as long as you then store them in an environment which is kept stable um, and cool and the humidity needs to be kept sort of 50, 50 percent. And that sort of is all that's required. Um, I mean, we have that's and as far as we can tell, that is all that you need to do. And that will keep them usable for potentially centuries. We've got stuff here that's well over 100 years old that was dried, probably more poorly dried than things would be now but we can still get useful DNA out of it, for instance. We had someone doing some research um, looking at genome sequencing for British fungi, and it, there seemed to be a strong correlation between usable DNA collected in the past from fungi in the past, say, 20 years. There's a strong correlation between how quickly and efficiently it was dried out by the person who collected it and how well we were able to get DNA out of it. So I think mm -hmm. it seems, you know, you get a good person who dries it quickly, not too hot, and then you keep it in good conditions and it will, it seems to be centuries is all, what we're looking at. For fungi, we have two very big rooms full of these cupboards where you can uh, store specimens. And also they are monitoring, for example, pests so that nothing gets wild there and, and starts to eat the fungi. 
mostly in the fungarium you will find mushroom forming fungi so something you can see with your bare eye however we also have uh, pathogenic fungi so for example rusts and smuts that are growing uh, on the leaves or on the flowers so part of our collections are also uh, dried plants so plants with these fungi so you can find uh, see these arcs a paper arcs where you can see, uh, see the pressed uh, plant and on top of those plant leaves for example you have a fungus in Q we don't have those so, so much but another option is also to store a culture so if you have a very teeny tiny fungus uh, well teeny tiny in a sense that it uh, forms a teeny tiny mushroom um, and it's hard to preserve like that you can culture it and then you can store the mycelium uh, in minus 80 and then that's the way to store the fungus and i'm guessing these are organized in a special way and is it alphabetical are you you know organizing it by basidiomycota ascomycota and then you know you have a cortinarius section over here you have a cordyceps section over here you know how, how is this organized um Usually, as you mentioned, it's organized by taxonomical order. So, Cortinaris is in one place, Rusla is in one place. There is also a bit of a geographical uh, organization. So, one room is dedicated to fungi collected from the UK, and then the other room is for the fungi collected from uh, um, other parts of the world. And within these two rooms, then, inside those they are in taxonomical order however this is now tricky because not all of the collections are digitized yet because it's a huge uh, work to put or to capture all the data and put it available online so only half of the specimens are currently digitized and half of them are not so all so six about 600,000 specimens are still not digitized and when the arrangement is like this if you would ask me how many specimens do we have from Congo or how many specimens do we have for example from a South American country like Bolivia I wouldn't be able to answer you at the moment because that kind of country information uh, is not something you can search by just going to the cuppers but you would need to capture first the label data have it online and then be able to search for it and uh, this is of course a problem and it has been recognized and one of the top priorities in Q is to basically get all of the data online searchable so that the collections would be the most useful for everyone. That is such a massive feat with, with so many different you know, species and, and collections. And I was reading that you, you have collected fungi from over 240 countries on all seven continents. I was looking it up because I was wondering how many countries there were, and according to ISO country code standard, there are 249 countries in the world. 194 of them are independent. So it seems you're missing about nine countries uh, to collect fungi from. Do you know, do you have a bucket list of, of countries that you haven't collected fungi from that you're dying to go to an expedition from, or or get people to send fungi from that certain country? So we have, don't have that yet. And as I mentioned, since we don't know exactly where all of our collections are from, uh, this is a sophisticated guess at the moment of uh, how many, uh, from how many, well, at least we know from how many countries we have, which are digitized, but there might be some more in those that are not right. digitized yet. But yes, that would be, really awesome to know it's like oh only five countries lacking anymore so <laughs> let's go hunting so. right 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 <laughs> yes right. of course there's... yeah that would be really fun <laughs> yes but of course there is also a division between different fungaria in the world so usually if you have a fungarium in in the country uh, you want to store the specimens from your own country the species that are collected from your own country so that's kind of usually the main thing people are focused on on having materials and then there are you want to have from different parts of the world where the researchers from your institute are working so usually it's it's kind of a combination of of 
of course, national things, and then what we are interested in internationally. But since Q has uh, such a large network and people have been working in many different parts of the world, plus people have been sending materials from different parts of the world to Q. So yes, that's a very amazing and impressive collection of fungi from all around the world. And since not all of them are studied yet, there are also many new species to science, even new genera and new families to science that are stored there and they are just waiting for someone to discover them. So almost 2,000 species, actually 1,886 species of fungi were scientifically named for the first time in 2019. I don't have any stats for 2020. Does this number keep going up? Is this really high for this year? Um, I'm just curious statistically on how many new fungi we're finding each year. So this uh, figure comes from the State of the World's Plant and Fungi Report. And uh, this is a very important report. Uh, in 2018, we did the first one uh, concentrated only on fungi, and it was, it was the first alike. And it was done, uh, led by Q, but done in cooperation with uh, researchers worldwide. And that report got a lot of attention. Uh, for example, in the UK, uh, it was uh, more in more than 150 articles were written about it in the papers and it was estimated that maybe 70% of the UK adults uh, got some information about this report. So this, uh, wow. yeah, so this, this kind of, a, uh, the report, it uh, aims to give a summary information of what is our current state of knowledge on fungal diversity, about the importance of fungi in the nature, uh, what are the uses of fungi, what are the threats of fungi, and what kind of actions we are taking to maintain the fungal diversity and its sustainable use. So one part of this report uh, was this uh, new species that I was writing together with my colleagues. And yes, 2,000 of species per year approximately, or a bit more, 2,500 are uh, described yearly. And uh, that has been quite stable for the last five years, uh, but before that it was less. And the main reason is the invention of molecular methods. So in fungi, they are quite hard to study. Uh, they Most of their time they live under the ground as hyphae and just uh, in certain times they form these uh, mushrooms or they don't form them at all. And characters that we can use to uh, differentiate between different species are few and there hasn't been that many researchers. Also, uh, the number of fungi is really big, so it's seven times more than the flowering plants. And uh, most of the fungi are still unknown. 90% of the species are still undescribed. So taking all of these things together, <laughs> the fungal species are poorly known. And when the molecular methods were invented, they allowed us far better to see uh, how uh, fungi should be classified. So we started to find, uh, not find, but maybe recognize the true diversity of fungi and also then the number of species that we described per year started to rise. Uh, currently, yes, we are doing this 2,000, 2,500 per year, which sounds quite a lot, like, oh wow, so many new species are found per year. But with the current speed, it will take us 1,000 years beho before we have described all the remaining ones. And yes, there are fungi that are important for us uh, in industry. So 60% of the enzymes that they use in industry come from fungi. And there are also medicines that come from fungi, penicillin, that is used to, to treat bacterial infections. And also there are uh, medicines for the multiple sclerosis and uh, to treat high cholesterol. So there are many different kinds of things we can get from fungi. And since they like to break down things, what what is really hot and pop and what uh, has been kind of been highlighted lately is that fungi can also break down plastic. So this can 
So basically, fungi, as we know more about them, they can probably, well, they already have and they will change our lives, but they can, may even save our lives. And by giving them a name, we basically recognize them and because without a name, they will go unnoticed, although they have these very, very important uh, functions in the nature and also benefits for us humans. And do you do any of that research at the Fungarium? Do you do chemical analysis to figure out any functional compounds or, you know, uh, uh, do analysis of the enzymes for microremediation purposes or anything like that? textile analysis or do you send these to third-party companies that can do that sort of analysis on all these new species? Uh, we don't do that much in Q. So most of our work is uh, focused on the classification of fungi. So basically producing uh, the framework and tools for the others to then go further with fungi. So we produce the classification. We recognize how they are uh, related to one another but then also we study their function in nature and in to some extent uh, their use as well but the main function uh, kind of the main purpose of Q is to study the biodiversity and uh, produce the kind of the baseline knowledge of the importance of fungi the shroom boom is here Fungal innovation in tech, medicine, fashion, therapy, and engineering are at an all-time high. And compared to the tens of thousands of species of the Fungarium, we estimate that a few hundred at best are currently showing up in research and development. And the fungi that are being investigated have already proved their profound potentials for a better future. And if we're barely using 1% of what we do know is out there, we are looking at a colossal selection of fungal partners. The Fungarium is here for us, and here for you. With over a million specimens and approximately 70,000 species, mycocurious minds like you have this truly epic resource. What are some extra special specimens at Kew, you ask? Well, while we agree that they are all important, we asked Lee, one of the curators at Kew, to describe specimens that are particularly memorable or hold some kind of superlative record. The smallest specimen of the fungarium we have, we have quite a lot of small, small specimens. Um, there's a whole group of fungi um, that are, are unicellular, so a single cell. Um, so for instance, things called chytrids, um, which are ecologically important that people might, in a way that people are aware of because these are pathogenic on amphibians. So there's been a lot of press over the past decade or two about chytrid fungi killing off amphibians. And we have we have a collection of chytrid fungi. So those are a, are a, a few tens of microns across, if you like. So these are microscopic slides that we have with minuscule little microscopic fungi on them. Um, the largest specimen I have is it's a bracket fungus. So this is a these are, are wood eating specialists, um, and they they form these sort of bracket or plate like fruiting bodies that come out of the sides of trees or, or rotting logs. Um, the biggest one I have is it's, it's like half, a, you know, it's about half a circle's worth and it's about two and a half feet across. I think it's an Inonotus that's about two and a half feet across. So are there any specimens that you particularly find memorable? Like if you were giving a tour and you wanted someone to be over the moon about what you have going on in the Fungarium, what would you show them? <laughs> Oof. So there's there's one specimen I always get out if I've got tours and what have you going on. Um, it's a fungus that's called um, Ophiocordyceps taylori. So it's a, it's a it's a parasite. It's a parasite of caterpillars. So it's a it's a, a specimen we've got. This particular one, it's about 150 years old and it comes from Australia. Um, and it's a first of all it's a caterpillar that's all dried up. But the caterpillar itself is a, a bigger than say your middle finger. It, you know it's a good three or four inches long. It's a big fat caterpillar um, but it's been parasitized parasitized by this fungus and the fruiting body growing out of the caterpillar itself is about eight nine inches long and is quite chunky looking mushroom produced this really big substantial mushroom type thing it's really gross um people get really freaked out and quite horrified at it. it's a great one to use it's enormous i mean we have a, we have a lot of um entomopathogenic fungi but they're all very 
small. We've got thing. We've got quite a lot of gunny eye here as well. But they, you know, they're, they're you know maybe an inch or two long. They're sort of slimmer than a pencil. But this thing is this Taylor eye I've got is just colossal. It's really chunky and grotesque. If you'd like to see photos of this monster cordyceps, be sure to check the show notes. It's delightfully morbid. We have this. Oh, there's one we uh, we call a squid fungus that is usually pretty nifty. So there's a there's a whole group of fungi that are what we call the stink horns. They're named the phalaceae, and they produce really unusual mushrooms. Um, they they've kind of gone beyond the normal mushroom shaped type fruiting body and they produce things you know they, they look the stink horns they look like uh penises they look like geodesic spheres um there's one this one particular this squid fungus it looks like an octopus or a squid emerging out the ground um and they all stink they all produce this <laughs> gunge called gleba that smells of rotting meat and poo um, and they use insects to disperse their spores rather than the normal sort of wind and air dispersal mechanisms of almost all other fungi and it looks gross and is just it's a great thing to whip out and show people. And not only does the Kew Gardens have the most impressive collection of specimens, but I read that your mycological library is one of the most extensive of taxonomic literature on fungi in the world. You've got books, periodicals, off prints, and so many other things. Can you talk about this collection of, of literature? Are you continuing to look for more things to add are you personally writing anything or is the queue writing any books to kind of wrap it all up i mean what what work is being done on the literary side of this we still keep uh, collecting literature both uh, journals and then uh, books they can be uh, books for public or more for identification but yes it's still uh, an important part uh, of, of Q's library work to collect uh, literature. Uh, especially when it comes to the books, uh, they are usually not uh, available online. So having them physically, uh, it's real an asset. And I have to admit that before I came to Q, I had difficulties to obtain literature or to, especially in taxonomy where you can have like 200 years old books that you would need to access and there are only a couple of copies of them uh, existing in the world. Uh, so when I came to Q, I was really, really like, wow, this is like a, a, a treasure for me because everything is just like uh, there available for you all the mm -hmm. uh, history, the memory, and all the information. So yes, it's really important still to have a place where where you can really physically have all uh, knowledge and literature gathered in one place. And I was, I was just chatting with Juliana Ferci, who is an incredible woman, and she's, uh, you know, one of my dear friends and she told me that she knows you and has traveled to Chile with you many times and actually you guys uh, both described a a new Cortinaria species together is that right yes that's correct and it was a really really beautiful one because it's uh, green uh, most of the Cortinaria species are brown <laughs> plus minus brown so they are not that <laughs> fancy looking <laughs> ones but this was green <laughs> so juliana was like Tula, i have a species here and it's green and she was taking so many photographs <laughs> of that, and she was like oh, this must be something very very uh, exciting and uh, it took a couple of years uh, to study the taxonomy but yes it turned out to be a new species to sci science and we decided to name it uh, Cortinarius chloro splendidus. So chloro uh, referring to green and splendidus, like a splendid appearance it had. So it's not a very huge, big one. So it's about uh, uh, the height of my fingers and the cap is maybe uh, three, four centimeters uh, wide. But the color, the green color, that was really striking and exotic. Juliana called you the the queen of Cortinarius, and you know she she wanted me to ask you about the old classification of Cortinarius based on how viscid the cap, stipe, or both was. It, it seems like there was a an old way to classify Cortinarius that that's pretty interesting. 
Yes. Um, always when you try to classify things, you try to select uh, characteristics that would be easy to use. And in Cortinarius, uh, the sliminess of the cap and uh, uh, the like how the uh, mushroom forms, uh, does it first open the cap and then the stipe elongates or does it uh, first elongate the stipe and then the cap opens? Uh, these type of characteristics were used uh, to put Cortinarius in uh, different genera or subgenera. And uh, after we started to use molecular methods, we realized that not all of these classifications were natural. So they were not really reflecting the uh, relatedness of the species in reality. Um, and now we are revising the classification of Cordinarius. However, to some extent, these still uh, hold. So of course, the more closely related the species are, the more similar they are. So some of the characters we had uh, selected before the molecular error to be used for the classification still hold, but some of them we need to revise and look for other characters that might better reflect uh, the natural classification of these fungi. But I think the, the sl sliminess is, is one thing that mm, is kind of... Uh, people probably like it because it's it's something you can easily uh, observe. It's, it's like, it's, cap slimy or not. Some of the coordinary species are so, so slippery slimy that they, they are even almost hard to pick up. So that, that's one good thing. And then the color. So uh, like obvious things, because there are species that are red, yellowish and, uh, and these greenish colors. So they were more like classified as the one group. And then there were more of these, which are dull colored ones. So Yes, uh, in the beginning we tended to use things that were easy to observe and easy to use for classification. And yeah, maybe I can tell one thing more what we use in Cortinarius. Some of the species in Cortinarius, they are very acrid or kind of uh, don't taste really ba uh, nice. And uh, you can uh, already by licking the cap, you can feel this acridness. And uh, one of the core... Uh, groups of Cordinarius is called uh, Vibratiles. So I uh, used to say to the people that you can recognize it so that uh, you lick the cap and then it makes you uh, vibrate. And that's... Uh, the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I love how many different ways there are to, you know, subtly ID a mushroom from, you know, the sliminess to the, the taste to even, you know, the smell. And th this has me thinking, if you have this many dried specimens in the fungarium, when you walk in, do you get hit by this, you know, is it just this waft of dried mushroom smell? I mean, is it really earthy in there? Or can you smell it at all if they're all, are they, you know, sealed in drawers? Hmm. Uh, you don't really smell that because they have been packed. Uh, so since they are in these envelopes and usually within the envelopes there are in these uh, small bags and then uh, these are again in uh, a cupboard uh, in the boxes and then in the cupboards so you can't really smell that much when you go into the fungarium however in some occasions when you open the box and then you take the specimens out uh, some fungi still have uh, the smell left but when you go the, into the fungarium no it's not <laughs> not earthy or anything it's just right more and more like a normal room but yes i wanted to add one thing to the previous um uh, question yep. so, of course tasting fungi don't ever taste a fungus unless you know which species that is so for example in Cortinarius there is one lineage where there are deadly poisonous uh, species so never ever lick taste or kind of bite a fungus unless you know what it is solid advice do you have a favorite Cortinaria species this is a tough question I'm thinking like which coordinators would me make me the most happy if I would find it? Mm, yeah, so there are different ways of approaching this. 
uh, one way would be this like which what would I most likely want to see? There is, for example, this kind of uh, this coordinatus called coordinatus in expectatus, uh, and I have never seen it in nature. It's it's said that it's usually growing uh, uh, in spring or early summer, and uh, when I started to study coordinatus uh, over twenty years ago, I had a coordinatus uh, uh, flora, or or this kind of an identification book and this species was in there so of course you always think that if a species is in a book it's something you can find so this species is still in my uh, to be found list so most of the other ones if not all i have already found myself but this coordinators in expectatus that's still hiding from me so that would be really nice to see I, and I'm sure you have such an interesting perspective on the whole mycology world. I know Cortinarius is is your bread and butter, but you know, working at the Kew Gardens and seeing the fungarium and all these different species in one place, uh, it it really gives you a ten thousand feet perspective, so to speak, on on all fungi in the world. So I'm curious what. What would you like to see in the mycological world? What what sort of research? What sort of advancements besides finding that one Cortinarius? Um, you know, what what would you like to see done or found, discovered, etc.? Um, uh, I will choose the one that is closest to me. So, what I would personally want to achieve is uh, a pipeline where. I could easily describe a fungal species and simultaneously an identification database would be created that then uh, would be possible to use by anyone who wants to re-identify that species. I think the uh, modern technology already would allow us to do that and that if, th if, if that could be achieved and uh, I would be able to um, deliver my knowledge with just one push of a button to anyone in the world that's my dream because that that would be super cool because there are so so many fungi to be found and things that we would need to know about them so the more easily I would be able to deliver my knowledge to anyone else uh, the better it would be to basically stop the biodiversity loss and then to uh, help people to study the many many uh, important things uh, the fungi do in the nature and how important they are to us i think the work that you guys are doing is unbelievable i i'm i'm super inspired and awed at at the work that everyone involved at, at q garden is is doing so so thank you I also want to tell our listeners about the State of the World report that you put out. The trend seems to be every two years, Kew Gardens releases a report on contemporary applications and understanding of fungi. And this was one of the more satisfying and comprehensive reads that I've come across on this topic. So thank you. Thank you to Kew and the 97 other institutions that collaborate on it. I will have links in the show notes for those of you who are interested and want to check it out. And Tula, if there is anything else that you want to share with us about your work or how we can support Q, we welcome that fully. Maybe I would say to anyone who is listening to this, um, I hope you will be excited about the wonderful world of fungi. Uh, and if you want to get more involved, uh, look uh, the local mushroom clubs. So, for example, in North America, the North American Mycological Association, or in the UK, the British Mycological Association, and then under those, the local clubs. Get involved, get with, uh, get uh, together with other people who are interested in fungi, uh, start to learn more about them, and then you might be part of the change and maybe help uh, the future research by being a citizen scientist or a field mycologist, maybe, as we talked uh, just a while ago, mapping uh, fungi that are uh, red-listed, 
mapping fungi for uh, conservation, for ecology, uh, for our increasing our understanding of a uh, fungal world. Thanks to Lee and Tula and the whole team at the Fungarium for building a super badass resource. And thank you listeners for tuning in and shrooming in and making this coverage possible. You can support the show and keep content like this coming by visiting our website, mushroomrevival.com and purchasing any of our products. And if you are a listener, which you are, by listening right now, you get a special discount for 10% off. Just enter MR Podcast at checkout. That's all capital letters, MR Podcast at checkout. Please keep spreading the spores. Tell all your friends, your family, your coworkers, everybody about mushrooms, the show, and how they can form a sacred relationship with fungi. And as always, mush love, and may the spores be with you. <laughs>